Please give Jerry a warm welcome to our pulpit as he comes to share the word. Are you? Thank you, sir. Are you going to start on the platform? <laughs> I'm going to start on the platform. I got something I need to do, first of all. all right. Stay right there. Right here? Stay right there. Um, Tony, hold this for me. And um, you know Brother Jesse flies a falcon. Brother Keith Moore flies a falcon. I fly a falcon. You have a falcon. And I just want to invite you to be a member of the Falcon Boys. Oh. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Looking good. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you get a Falcon, you can be a member too. Oh, by the way, uh, the initiation fee is 100000 <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Go ahead and be seated. <laughs> I am the president, though. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good, isn't he? Yeah. I am so thrilled about that falcon and what it's going to be used for because uh, missions has always been the heartbeat of our ministry. I have preached in 49 different nations around the world in 53 years. And most of those nations, I don't just go and preach. I'm a planter. I have an apostolic anointing. We plant churches and orphanages, Bible schools. And uh, so now that I have the Falcon 50, that'll take me anywhere in the world. The other day I was flying overseas, over the Pacific, 43,000 feet, doing a little over 500 miles an hour and I waved at American Airlines below me as I passed them by. <laughs> and what a joy it was, praise God. You say, well, I don't know why preachers need their own airplanes. Well, go with us sometime. You'll find out. I'm not too good to fly the airlines. I've paid my dues. In fact, American, uh, American Airlines sent me a card about three years ago that said I had flown with that one airline 4.5 million miles. So I paid my dues. That's just one airline. I'm not talking about Delta. I'm not talking about Lufthansa. I'm not talking about all the others I've flown around the world. So um, um, if you have a problem with a preacher having an airplane, get over it. <laughs> this is my 10th debt-free airplane since I've been in the ministry. And it won't be the last. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Before I ask you to open your Bibles tonight, uh, I want to ask you a question. Have any of you noticed how fast time seems to be flying here lately? I remember when I was a young boy, high school, I could hardly wait to graduate and get on with my life. And my dad would say, son, just enjoy being 18, or 17 at the time, just enjoy being 17, because when you get to be my age, 20 years passes by so quick, you'll wonder where it went. Well, I, I didn't see it that way when he said that. And now I'm older than my dad was uh, when he went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. I'm 75 now. Dad went on to be with the Lord at 72. But now that I'm 75, he was right. Time is flying by. Has anybody noticed that? Yes. It is flying by. Now, in 20 years, I turned 75 on December the 24th. And uh, I'm closer to 76 now than I am 75. And it seems like I just turned 75. That's right. Where's all the time going? In 20 years, I'll be 95. I wonder if I'll still be handsome. <laughs> I wonder if I'll be any taller. <laughs> Just as long as Jesse's not any much taller than me, that's fine with me, praise God. <laughs> so time is, is speeding by. I read an article not too long ago, and I don't want to misquote it. And... Uh, 
I want to get my glasses out here. Jesse said, I've never seen you wear glasses before. I only have to if I've been reading a lot, preaching a lot, traveling a lot. So that pretty well covers it all. <laughs> and uh, I want to get them out so I don't overlook this. And Carolyn says, I look distinguished. Yes. Not extinguished, distinguished. <laughs> <clears throat> I read an article not too long ago in a magazine that said, psychologists tell us that as we age, the pace of life appears to speed up. That's interesting. The pace of life seems to speed up. Now we know that, uh, you know, it still takes 365 days in a year. It still takes, you know, 28 to 31 days in a month, seven days in a week. But it seems like those weeks and months and years are just flying by. And I believe personally, in fact, I was talking to Billy Brim about this not too long ago. I believe that the closer we get to the appearing of the Lord, time is going to speed up even more than it is right now. And we are getting close. Carolyn sent me an article yesterday. I was down, um, I'd just come back from a meeting and I was down at, we have a, a home uh, about 30 miles from our primary home on the Brazos River. And I go down there uh, in between meetings to rest and get ready to go on my next meeting. And she sent me this article while I was down there. It is a video. In fact, it was a video that she sent on my phone. A pastor out in California was talking about a law that Israel just passed on Monday, stating that the nation is leaning toward a cashless society. The chief of, of the Israel tax authority said, we want the public to reduce the use of cash money. Israel will ban cash payments that are over the equivalent of 4,400 US dollars. This means that an individual living in Israel will no longer be able to pay cash for a used car that would cost more than $4,400 or high cost clothing or designer bags or any other items that is costing more than that amount. This is a sign of the times and the most part of the world is moving toward a cashless society. It's already happening in parts of America. Does this sound like Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 where it talks about the mark of the beast. It says, and be, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number in his hand. The Greek word used here for mark of the beast is the word related to a brand that is seared into an animal like cattle to denote ownership. So likewise, taking the mark of the beast denotes ownership of that person taking it and it is connected to loyalty to the Antichrist. Now, that's Revelation chapter 13. How close are we to that being fulfilled? Now, the good thing is, everybody in here saved? Amen. We're going to be out of here before all that happens. Right. But we're rapidly approaching that time. Just look at the sign of the times. All you got to do is watch CNN. Don't watch it very long, just a couple of minutes. <laughs> and you will see that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled every day. That's right. Every day. There's more prophecies being fulfilled today than ever in the history of Christianity. So we are rapidly moving toward the appearing of the Lord, the catching away of the saints, and what we do now, we do quickly. That's the reason why you need that Falcon 50 in the air and getting the job done. That's the reason why I need mine in the air and getting the job done. Amen. Um, I, I don't mean to be critical, but the airlines are not getting any better. 
I was in Naples, Florida this past weekend. I was speaking at a Amway uh, high echelon management uh, conference. And uh, while I was there, of course, we, Carol and I flew down in our aircraft. And uh, while I was there, there were thunderstorms all over Florida, just all over Florida. And just before we took off to come back home, we got word that there were over a thousand flights canceled by the commercial airlines. In fact, my daughter Terry was speaking in a conference in Orlando at the same time I was in Naples. And I didn't know it because we were already en route uh, going up to Alabama to, to visit our uh, granddaughter, our great granddaughter and, and her mother. And, uh, but when we landed, Terry texted Carolyn and said, my flight's been canceled again. We're stuck in Orlando. I don't know how long they had to stay there. But a thousand flights had been canceled. And somebody says, why do you need an airplane? That's one reason. JSMI Airlines never leaves without me. <laughs> I'm never late. Not only that, <laughs> we don't have cancellations. In fact, all those thunderstorms were going on when we were getting ready to leave Naples. And my chief pilot come back and gave me a, a, a rundown of our flight pattern and so forth. And he said, no, Brother Jerry, and he showed me the, the, the uh, uh, charts and everything, radar. And there were thunderstorms on both sides of the direction we were going up toward Huntsville, Alabama. And I said, well, Brad, now we don't take chances uh, I don't have to be anywhere for any reason if it, if it puts my life in jeopardy or anybody on our airplane. We don't, do, we don't take chances. But there was a, 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 a possibility that it would all be passed by by the time we got about halfway up to where we were going. I said, well, Brad, the God I serve, if he can make a way through the sea, he can make a way through the sky. <laughs> And we had clear sailing all the way. But the commercial airlines wind up having to cancel a thousand flights. So my point is this. Jesus is coming soon. The rapture of the church, as Jesse has said many times, and I agree, I'd be surprised if I wasn't alive at the rapture of the church. How many of you feel that way? I mean, it's, it's right up on us. Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but get right with God. Hilton Sutton wrote a book a number of years ago before he went on to be with the Lord, and it was entitled, Get Right or Get Left. <laughs> get right, amen. But thank God we'll be out of here. I don't know about all of you, but I'm going out on the first load. Okay. I know there are a lot of people that are mid-tribulation and post-tribulation. And if you believe that, that's fine. You're going to get what you believe for, be it under thee according to thy faith. And while I'm gone, you can have my car. But in seven years, I'm coming back for it. <laughs> so my point is, things are speeding up. Things are speeding up very, very rapidly. Now, in Daniel chapter two, you don't have to turn there, but just make a note of this. Daniel says that only God can change the times and the seasons. Only God can change the times and the seasons. When referring to the great tribulation period, Jesus made this statement in Matthew 24, 22. And unless these days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Since God created time in the first place, then he can change whatever he deems necessary to change. Would you agree with that? Okay. So he has the ability to slow things down. He also has the ability to speed things up. It's at his discretion. I had the Lord say to me in October of this past year, as you've heard me say in times past when I've come here, uh, every year since 1981, uh, Brother Copeland prophesied over me that I was entering into a new dimension of ministry. He said, God is calling you into 
the office of the seer. It's part of the prophetic ministry. And he said he's going to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them wherever he might send you. And then shortly after that, Brother Hagin prophesied over me just a month later and said almost exactly the same thing. And then shortly after that, Brother Oral Roberts wrote me a four-page handwritten letter stating that the last time he heard me preach, he saw me preaching prophetically. And he said, I want to encourage you every time you go to the pulpit, preach prophetically. And then my fourth mentor, which was T.L. Osborne, Brother Osborne said to me one day uh, before he, uh, well, a long time before he went home to be with the Lord, this is back in the uh, early 90s, he said, uh, Brother Jerry, uh, God's moving you into a new dimension of ministry. He said, you're, and I, I'm just repeating what he said. I don't, I'm not trying to be braggadocious, but I'm just repeating his exact words. He said, you're a great communicator. He said, nobody can tell a story like Jerry Savell. He said, I encourage you every time you go to the pulpit, be God's communicator. And so all four of my mentors saw basically the same thing happening in my life and ministry uh, pretty much about the same time. So since that time, I have set aside uh, the month of October to get before the Lord and to find out what's on his agenda for the coming new year. And once I hear it, then that's what I preach everywhere I go until he tells me otherwise. Now, the first place I take the message is to my own church back in Crowley, Texas, just a suburb of Fort Worth. I'm the founder of the church, but I'm the worst attending member there. Uh, I'm gone all the time. I get to preach in my own church about eight or maybe 10 times a year because I'm, I'm traveling all the time. But we have wonderful pastors there. They do an excellent job. But as soon as I receive that prophetic word, the first place I preach it is in my own church, and I spend about three weeks in a row uh, talking about that message. Well, this brings me to this point. In October of 2021, when I set that time aside, uh, I usually begin by just praying in the Spirit. This was on October the 1st. I'll pray in the spirit for quite some time and I have a special place that I go for prayer and seeking the Lord uh, for that prophetic word. And uh, that particular day, every time I closed my eyes, I kept seeing a hand come out of heaven, an open hand. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept happening. Every time I closed my eyes, pray in the spirit, I kept seeing this open hand come out of heaven. I said, Lord, does this have anything to do with a prophetic word that you want me to share in 2022? He said, it has everything to do with it. He said, tell the people, now listen up, tell the people wherever you go in 2022 that if they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is happening in the world around them, I will open my hand and cause them to experience Unusual, supernatural, and extraordinary provision. Amen. Now, I want you right now to make a decision. Say this with me. Lift your right hand to God and say this with me. In the name of Jesus, as of right now, today, I will no longer be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is taking place in the world around me. I will not be shaken by it. As Paul would say, none of these things move me. Therefore, I am a candidate to experience the open hand of God and causing me to have supernatural, unusual, extraordinary provision. Amen. So be it. I receive it and give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, every year when I receive that prophetic word, uh, that's what I preach everywhere I go, all over the world. In fact, there are a lot of churches that consider me an apostle to their church and pastors all over the world eagerly await to hear what the Lord has given me. And then they start preaching it. After they hear me preach it, they preach it to their own congregation. By the time I get there, I, I don't care where it's at, Africa, Europe, 
they, they have uh, posters and, and banners put up in their church with that prophetic word, knowing, uh, letting me know that that's what they've been preaching to their congregation as well. So I started out uh, October the 1st receiving this word. And then shortly after that, as I continued to pray, the Lord said this to me, and tell them. Did your neighbor say, listen up now. <laughs> and tell them they have entered into a time of divine acceleration. Amen. Divine acceleration. Amen. That's the reason I started with the comments I made about it seems like everything is speeding up. Amen. We have entered into a time of divine acceleration. Yes. God reserves the right to speed up things if he desires or slow down things if he desires. But right now, what's on his mind is acceleration. Amen. I, I kind of feel like that Jesus is nudging him and saying, can I go get them now? Can I go get them now? You know, the Bible says no man knows the hour. But, but, but uh, you know, according to the book of Acts, there's certain things that have to be fulfilled. And then heaven will release Jesus to come and get us. And I, I, I kind of sense that, you know, Jesus being on the right hand, he's nudging the Father and saying, can I go get them now? How much longer? And I think the Father is saying, almost. Just a few more minutes. Just a few more days, whatever. And we are out of here, folks. That's right. But be Hallelujah. between that now and that time, we got to occupy until he comes. And what we do, we got to do it quick. That's the reason why God is blessing us with fast aircraft. That's right. That's right. Amen. My first airplane, it wasn't much faster than a lawnmower with wings, but it was paid for, praise God. <laughs> Amen. And I, I enjoyed it, man. It was a blessing because I thought, this country bumpkin now owns an airplane debt-free. And, uh, and then I flew it for a while and, of course, flying with Brother Copeland, I got the bug when he learned to fly, so I was flying that little plane back then. And, uh, and then I sewed it into another ministry and believed God for something bigger and faster and, and uh, wound up, the next one was a Cessna 310. It was a little faster, did fly a little further and a little higher. And then I, I blessed another ministry with that and uh, I wound up with a 421 Golden Eagle now I'm in cabin class, like we say in the South. We in high cotton now, praise God. And that was a nice airplane. Loved every minute of it that I had it. And then the Lord told me to uh, repaint it, put new interior in it, new avionics, overhaul the engines, and give it away. I had 20 hours on it when the Lord told me to give it away. And, uh, but that set the stage for my jet. And now I've owned about four jets since that time. And uh, the one I'm in now, the Falcon 50, flies higher, faster, and further than any plane I've ever owned. And I give God all the glory for it because it is such a blessing, such a blessing. And because I'm, I'm, I travel about 20 days out of every month and have done so for 53 years, that enables me to have less wear and tear on this 75-year-old body. Amen. I don't have any problem getting down. It's the getting back up. It's, it's a little harder. <laughs> Amen. But God has been faithful. And I'm, I, I believe that if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you are sensing that we are in a time of divine acceleration. Does anybody sense that? Come on, let's lift our hands and thank God we're living in such a time as this. Now, in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus was asked the question by his disciples, what are the signs of the end? What are the signs of your return? And of course, he's talking about uh, not beyond the, the, the uh, rapture of the church. And he listed about a number of things that would be happening. And then he said this about them. These are the beginning of sorrows. And then he said this statement in verse six, but the end is not yet. So we are seeing some of those things that he described that he referred to as the beginning of sorrows. 
There's a lot of things happening in the world around us right now. The, the, the world we live in today is not the same world we lived in just three years ago when the pandemic hit. Things have changed. Things are changing rapidly. And so Jesus said, this is the beginning of sorrows, but the end is not yet. The Apostle Paul even says in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. The earth itself. That's what all this stuff is, is about. All this, all this chaos that's taking place in the world. The, 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 the chaotic things that are happening in the weather patterns and, and, and uh, uh, all the uh, tornadoes and the earthquakes and all that stuff that's happening. It seems like they're happening more and more frequently than ever before. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I was born in Mississippi on a farm in Mississippi. And I remember one tornado coming through uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, my hometown. And uh, uh, I was about maybe 10 years old, something like that, if that old. And my uncle, my dad's youngest brother, he rode Harleys and he rode me to the drive-in theater in Vicksburg. And we're, we're uh, sitting down on the ground there, parked his Harley next to the speaker and we're watching a John Wayne Western. All of a sudden, we heard this noise. And boy, it was loud. It sounded like a freight train coming through there. And the next thing we knew, then the, the, the screen on that, that uh, theater, drive-in theater, it was ripping apart. My uncle said, get on, son. We got to get out of here. And we're, we're driving down old Highway 21 on that motorcycle. And I'm looking back at that tornado following us. Uh, I wasn't a praying boy up to that time. But boy, you ought to heard me shucking the corn that day. <laughs> I'm praying. And uh, Johnny's trying to outrun that, that tornado. And it did some destruction there. The next day when we went back into town, there was a lot of destruction. But I don't remember too many tornadoes in my hometown of Vicksburg after that. But now, you know, I'm in Texas and we're, we're real close to Tornado Alley, they call it. You know, the Panhandle of Oklahoma, Panhandle of Texas, Panhandle of Oklahoma. I was in Abilene one day uh, and I, I told Carol, I said, I'm just going to get in my truck and drive to Abilene and uh, uh, not fly and not take anybody with me. I'm just going to go and, and spend a couple of days with some friends there and have lunch with them and, and uh, do the meeting that I was scheduled to preach in and then drive back home. So that night I'm, I'm in my hotel and I'm getting ready to go to the service. And I walk outside and I open the door to my truck and I saw a tornado forming right across the road. Boy, it was, it was coming up bad. I, I walk back in the hotel real quick to see what the weather man was saying. And, and he was talking about, folks, find cover quickly. This thing is, is, is ripping through Abilene, and, and uh, it is capable of a lot of destruction. Find cover as quickly as you can. Well, it kind of went off to the right of the highway there, but I could still see it. And the church that I was going to was just a few blocks down the road from the hotel. So I got in my truck and drove down to the church and everybody in the church was outside pointing at that thing and praying against it. And uh, so we all stood there and spoke to it and, and commanded it to wither from the roots, you know, and, uh, and, and we saw it just fizzle out, just fizzle out. And then when I got back to the hotel that night, uh, the weatherman said, well, folks, we've had a miracle in Abilene. He said it looked like there was a giant hand just reached down and picked it up and it was gone. It was over and there was no destruction whatsoever. Amen. Amen. But that was quite some time ago. It seems like we're having more tornadoes, more earthquakes, more floods, everything. This planet is experiencing chaos. And Paul says the whole earth groans in travail, wanting to get out from under the curse. Amen? Right. So we are rapidly approaching 
the appearing of Jesus and the catching away of the saints. Now, ask any woman who's ever given birth to a child. Do the pains intensify the closer you get to delivery? I wouldn't know, but my wife told me so. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in boot camp when my first daughter was born. I, I never saw Jerry in until she was three and a half months old. I was up in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then I, I, I got a three-day pass. I was supposed to only go 150-mile radius of Fort Dix. And I went to Philadelphia, jumped on an airplane and flew all the way home because I'd never seen my daughter yet. And then I uh, got on the plane and flew back, got there just in time before I was AWOL. And uh, so then I spent uh, the next several weeks in AIT, and then from there went down to Fort Polk, and then Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. And uh, uh, there was times when we were wondering... If I, if I was going to wind up having to go to Vietnam, they said we were, we were going to Nam. This is 1968. Uh, Vietnam War is hot and heavy in, going on at the time. And right at the last minute, uh, our, the company commander came in and said, uh, the governor of the state of Louisiana wants one unit to stay back home. The civil rights movement was going on at the same time. Wants one unit to stay home and you're going to be trained by the state police for riot control. And it happened to be my unit. So I, Carolyn was praying I wouldn't have to go to Nam. I wound up uh, training with the state police and riot control. And since I was a farm boy, <laughs> raised on a farm in Mississippi, and my grandfather and my father taught me how to shoot weapons, and uh, I, I uh, uh, was, a, was very handy with a rifle and whatever they put in my hand. And... Uh, qualified expert and everything they had me to shoot. So I wind up being a sniper on tower buildings during riots and tornadoes and flooding and, and all of that stuff going on in, in different parts of the South. And uh, thank God I never had to shoot anybody. But <clears throat> all of that, every time there was something like that happened, our unit got called up to go help maintain the peace. Okay, But it's happening more now happening more and more frequently now. It's a sign of the times. Can you say amen? amen? A sign of the times. So the earth is experiencing birth pains, just like a woman does. <clears throat> they intensify and they come more rapidly, I'm told. Yes, amen. 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 That's true. Thank you. Yes. They intensify and they come more rapidly. And the more they intensify, the less you like her, your husband, right? Because <laughs> he was responsible, wasn't he? <laughs> That's what we are experiencing right now, birth pangs. Jesus is coming soon. The rapture of the church is a bonus. And I would drink to that. <laughs> Excuse me. Listen to this. <coughs> Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 makes this statement. Forgive me, I've been preaching a lot. I just came out of Brother Copeland's Believers Convention. Oh, yeah. Then from there, traveled somewhere, and then from there, Naples, and then from there, here. So uh, my th throat is recovering, and in just a few moments, it'll be back to normal, okay? So just bear with me for a moment. So Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, talking about the end times, it says, knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge shall be increased. Just think how fast we can get information today. You can get millions of facts in, a, in just a few seconds on your iPad, on your iPhone. And even though you can get them so rapidly now, 
there are people still complaining that it's not fast enough. How many of you remember when McDonald's opened in your community? When I was uh, in high school in Shreveport, Louisiana, all of us guys hung out at the Dairy Queen that was not too far from the high school. And uh, especially all the guys with hot cars. We, we all parked, we had our special spot. And we parked, we, we, we backed into that slot and anybody that drove around and gave you a thumbs up, that meant they wanted to drag you. And so we'd go down to the end of 70th Street. We already had a quarter of a mile marked off and we raced. And if you didn't win, you lost your spot at the Dairy Queen. If you win, if you won, you got to park in your spot again, okay? And I had one hot 57 Chevrolet. My dad raced automobiles all my young life, and he saw to it I never owned anything slow. <laughs> Amen. I was into speed, and I'm not talking drugs, I'm talking horsepower. I don't know anything about that other kind of speed. You'll have to ask Jesse about that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Jesse told me he used to take trips all over the world, never left his living room. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was into horsepower, speed, and I, and I still am. You know, every once in a while, I, I feel a need for speed. And uh, that's the reason I like fast motorcycles. I like fast cars, and, and uh, I like fast airplanes. Anything that's fast, I enjoy it. And I believe God's into speed. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I really believe God is into speed. That's another thing that I really enjoy about hanging out with him. He's into speed. He has a chariot that is as fast as the lightning is from the east to the west. Amen. That's fast. And when I get to heaven, being an old ex paint body man, if he will allow me, I'm going to paint some flames on that chariot <laughs> and see if I can drive it for myself. Amen. God's into speed. God's into acceleration. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you to prove that to you. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. That's speed, folks. A whirlwind is a violent wind moving with great force. And the Bible describes his chariot goes like a whirlwind. And the book of Jeremiah agrees with Isaiah as uh, Jeremiah 4.13 says, Behold, he shall come as clouds. Now, any of you used to be drag racers? Anybody used to drag race? That's what you call a burnout. His chariot will come like clouds. A burnout. A burnout is when you line up and uh, you, you smoke the tires uh, get them heated so that you get better traction, okay? So God's into burnouts. <laughs> he likes to burn rubber in that chariot before he takes off, hallelujah. <laughs> this is my sermon. I can tell it the way I want to. <laughs> I, I, I believe scriptures like this proves he's into speed. Behold, he shall come as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind, and his horses are swifter than eagles. Does that not sound like God's in the speed? Okay. So, there's nothing quite like being able to take off in an extremely fast car and do a burnout before you leave the, the, uh, the tree and uh, make it down to the end of the runway and look behind you and the guy you're racing is not quite up to par. That's just exhilarating. I, I preach uh, up until uh, the pandemic hit. I preach in Italy every year. And uh, <clears throat> one year, 2000, uh, about 2018, while I was there, I got to visit the Ducati plant, motorcycles. And they gave me a VIP tour. And after they gave me the tour, they put me on a brand new Ducati motorcycle and allowed me to ride it through the Italian Alps. And it was so much fun. It was so beautiful and that bike was just amazing. 
And then I left there, and the next week, I went over to the Ferrari plant. And they didn't give me a VIP tour, but they gave me kind of a general public tour. And uh, so when they got through with the tour, I said, uh, Ducati, let me ride one of their new motorcycles. You gonna let me drive one of your Ferraris? They said, no. <laughs> <clears throat> so the next year I went back, Tony was with me, and my uh, international director from South Africa was with me, my national director, international director uh, for the world that works at our ministry in Fort Worth. Uh, they were with me. And so uh, a, a man came to our meetings and he was an executive at the Ferrari plant. And he said, I heard you came last year and you didn't get the VIP tour. I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, I've arranged for you to have a VIP tour. And when you get through with the tour, I have a, we have assigned a Formula One driver to ride with you in one of our new Ferraris. Would you like to do that? I said, is the Pope Catholic? Yes, I'd like to do that. <laughs> so we all went over to the Ferrari plant, and I'm telling you, I've, I've always been into excellence, but I've never seen excellence like this Ferrari plant. I mean, you can eat off the floors. The mechanics are wearing white uniforms. You, you don't just go walk in there and buy a Ferrari. You, you're on a list to get a, a new Ferrari. They took us from the front door all the way through the plant and showed us uh, the construction of the Ferraris, every model, and, uh, and the museum where they have old Ferraris that have won Formula One races and all that, you know. And then uh, they introduced me to the Formula One driver. And he said, I've been assigned to take you in one of our new Ferraris, and uh, I have a question. He said, now we have a test track here on the grounds of Ferrari. And you can either drive the test track or you can drive the Ferrari out to the back country. I said, what would you suggest? He said, oh, the back country, it's more fun. I said, then let's do the back country. He said, get in, you're the driver. He sat down beside me and uh, told me everything about the car, you know. And then we took off, we left all the crew there uh, and waving bye. <laughs> and so we went just out of town and he said, now we're going to go a little further and there will be a roundabout. And when you get to this roundabout, I want you to go around it at a certain speed. And then when we come around where we enter it, I want you to pick up the speed considerably. I want you to see how this car hugs the track. And so we come around and we picked up the speed. And then he said, now pick up speed the next time again. And we did four times around that roundabout and kept picking up the speed. That car was effortless. And then he said, now you see that straight away on the other side of the roundabout? When you get there this time, go for it. I said, are you serious? He said, go for it. This car will do 225 miles an hour. Help yourself. <laughs> Man, I punched that thing and we took off down through that straightaway. I could not wipe the smile off my face when I got home for two months. <laughs> How fast did you go, Brother Jerry? Right at 180 miles an hour. And we still had some pedal on the floor, but I decided I'll come back and do it again next time. You know? <laughs> A hundred, nearly 180 miles an hour. And, and we didn't even get all that was there. It was so exhilarating. And then I read scriptures like this and think, God must have been laughing at me, saying to Jesus, he thinks that's fast. <laughs> hey, he got a thrill out of that slow thing. God is into speed. And if he decides to accelerate something, then who's to stop him? Who, who commands God? Amen? So we are rapidly approaching some things that have been prophesied throughout the ages that will take place just before the rapture of the church. So I'm talking about divine acceleration. Divine acceleration. Now, there's a phrase in the Bible that I know you're familiar with, and if you're not 
become familiar with it. And that phrase is this. It's found in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come. But when the fullness of time was come. And you know the rest of it. God sent his son. God had a schedule, an agenda, and everything had to be in place before Jesus could come and redeem mankind. He had an assignment. And when the fullness of time had come, then God sent his son to redeem you and me. Satan had to stand by and watch it happen. Now he remembered Genesis where God told Satan, the serpent as he was known then, that there will come a seed who will bruise your head. And Satan didn't know who that seed was. He had to wait all that time until this fullness of time had come. I mean, he probably thought Abraham might be the seed. This old man's having kids when he's old. Maybe Abraham's the seed. But he had to wait and watch Abraham die. He wasn't a seed. What about Moses? I mean, Moses, he's got to be the seed. But he has to watch Moses die, and he wasn't the seed. What about David? Mighty valor, great man, a warrior. He had to watch David die and he wasn't the seed. It's got to be Samson. There's got to be Samson. This man can slay a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, but he has to watch Samson die. He's not the seed. And he watched generation after generation after generation, and he didn't know who the seed was until this moment when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan and the voice came out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son. And that's when Satan found out who the seed was. But notice, all that time he couldn't stop the seed from coming. When God says that something is going to happen, no devil, no demon, no government can keep Amen. it from happening. Amen. If it's on God's agenda, if it's on God's timetable, then you just, as my father-in-law used to say, just hide and watch, it's gonna happen. Amen. Right. Amen. So if Satan couldn't stop the seed from coming the first time, he certainly can't stop him from coming the next time. That's right. amen. Can you say amen? amen? I think you want to give the Lord a good shout over that, praise God. Yeah. Amen. So notice in the fullness of time. Now, let me give you a definition and I, I didn't come up with this myself. I, I heard somebody say it uh, sometime back, and I can't improve on it, so I'm just going to borrow it. Divine acceleration is the supernatural ability of God to bring his plans, his purposes, and his will to pass at a much faster rate than is humanly possible. Let me say that again. Divine acceleration is the supernatural ability of God to bring his plans, his purposes, and his will to pass at a much faster rate than is humanly possible. When God decides it's time for something to come to pass, then nothing can stop it from happening. So once again, when the fullness of time was come, what I sense in my spirit is we are upon another fullness of time. God has seen where we are and he knows where we are. Obviously, everything is open and naked unto him. It never catch God by surprise. Amen. He didn't lean over to Jesus and say, did you know that pandemic was coming? I didn't know that. He, they didn't take him by surprise. And by the way, this is not God's first pandemic. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. As we say in Texas, it's not his first rodeo. Wouldn't you call Egypt a pandemic? <laughs> I don't know what the botch of Egypt is, but it sounds like coronavirus. You know? <laughs> so this is not God's first time uh, <clears throat> to deliver his people 
out of a pandemic. And it didn't catch him off guard. He didn't, he, he wasn't totally surprised when it all happened. I was in Denver, Colorado preaching in March of 2020. I just finished a, a weekend meeting and finished on Sunday night, got in my plane, flew home. And when I landed the next day, the pandemic hit. It caught me off guard. I didn't know it was coming, but it didn't catch God off guard. Amen. He's fully aware of what everybody's been going through. But at the same time, he is working. <laughs> I know, I know, a good choice of word. He, he's, he's working rapidly yes. to bring this thing to an end. Yes. Amen. Amen. And once again, what we do, we must do quickly. Amen. We don't have time to play church anymore. Right. Can you say amen? amen? So now listen to this. The Bible says that when you see all these things happening, Paul referred to them as perilous times. When you see all these perilous times, the Amplified says things that are hard to deal with and hard to bear. That's what uh, a lot of people have described these times as. It's, it's hard. It's hard, Brother Jerry. It's, it's hard to bear up under this. Well, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, said that these times would come. But if you look at verse 14 of that same chapter in Timothy, it says that the solution to overcoming these difficult times is continue in the things which you have learned. Amen. Continue in the things which you have learned. The word of faith message has never been more important to you right now. That's a fact. That's a fact. Amen. That's good. That's good. This is not the time to go look for some other message. That's right. This is the only one that will work. And I'm saying to you, I've been living this way for 53 years and it has worked wonderfully. My mama didn't raise no fool and I'm going to keep living it. I'm going to keep doing it. And I believe, praise God, the same God that's delivered me time after time after time and brought me through everything that Satan tried to use to stop me, even tried to kill me, even tried to take me out. God enabled me to overcome that. Amen. And he's going to keep right on doing it. Praise God. Amen. 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 But we stuck to the word all the way through this thing. Never, never got off the word. And this is not the time to start looking for some other message. This is the time to double up. Praise God. This is the time to get in the word like you've never been before and get to the place where you can say like the apostle Paul, I am fully persuaded. Amen. I am fully persuaded. Amen. Amen. I am deeply committed. No turning back. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, no turning back. No in fact, tell somebody, my best days are not behind me. My best days are just ahead of me. And give the Lord a good shout if you believe that. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Continue in the things which you have learned. The message translation says, don't let it phase you. Stick with what you've learned and believed. Don't let it phase you. Stick with what you've learned and believed. The Passion Translation says, advance in strength with truth, a truth wrapped around your heart. Advance in strength with truth wrapped around your heart. That's how you overcome what is going on in this world around us. But here's the good thing. We've entered into a time of acceleration. Now, I have to tell you this. That doesn't mean that you no longer have to use your faith. That's right. That's right. It just means, I think you'll like this part. It just means it's not going to take as long for things to happen as it has in the past. Amen. That's right. Amen. I receive That's right. it. Now, when, when the Lord said this to me on October the 1st, 2021, about the open hand of God. And he said, and tell them that we've entered in, they've entered into a time of divine acceleration. I preached that in my church, as I mentioned earlier, the following Sunday. Okay. Now that was just a few days later after I had received that prophetic word. I began preaching it in my church. 
and I was planning on preaching it for the next two weeks after that. Someone, one of the first pieces of mail that came into our ministry after the Lord gave me this. Now, I did say this to him, and I say it to him every year. Now, Lord, uh, I would appreciate if you would confirm this word in me and in my life so that it will give validity to the message when I take it to others. That's right. The Bible says he confirms the word with signs following. Right. Yeah. And so I, I always say after I receive that prophetic word, Lord, uh, I would appreciate if you would confirm this regarding the open hand of God, supernatural, extraordinary, unusual provision, and a time of acceleration. I would appreciate it if you would confirm this in me before I start taking it to the world. Okay? So a few days later, I preached it in my church. On Monday, one of the first pieces of mail that was opened in our ministry was a check for a million dollars. Now, it's not the first million dollar check that our ministry has received, but it was the quickest one. It was the fastest one. Hallelujah. And I said, Lord, you are into speed. Hallelujah. <laughs> and if you want to, you can do it again as often as you want to. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And the person who sent it didn't even go to our church. He hadn't even heard me preach this yet. Okay. God was showing me that if you will not be moved, all the chaos and all the disorder that is happening in the world around you, I will open my hand and cause you to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Not only that, I'm accelerating things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Hallelujah. once again, that doesn't mean that you don't have to use your faith anymore. It just means it's not going to take as long for manifestations as you use your faith. That's right. God That's right. is speeding up the process. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying it. Praise God. Amen. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, I, am ex I am really enjoying it. And I believe he's no respecter of persons. It's available to anybody in this room and everybody that's watching this, this program tonight. Amen. Amen. But the, the, the prerequisite was don't be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder. So that means you may have to turn CNN off a while. Did my mic go off? I got no response. I, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says, faith cometh by watching CNN. No. <laughs> faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Now, there is something that cometh by watching CNN, fear, dread, sorrow, depression. Yeah, but don't you want to be informed of what's going on, Brother Jerry? Are you kidding me? I am informed. I got this book. I just told you what's going to happen at the end. Amen. Read the back of the book, folks. We win. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We win. Yes, we Amen. I'm informed. <laughs> Without all the chaos involved in it that would cause you to become depressed and, and uh, feel like, dear God, what are we going to do now? We're just going to keep living this way. We're going to keep believing God. We're going to keep doing the things that we've learned to do that have brought results to us up to now. And God is going to keep right on honoring because he is the faithful God. Can you say amen? All right, now listen to this. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 12 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, Gross darkness to people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. God is telling us in these verses that as the world gets darker and darker, the church is going to get brighter and brighter. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. The world is getting darker. Would you agree? Yes. Well, that means the church is going to get brighter and brighter, praise oh, God. Yes. So once again, our best days are not behind us. Our best days are just ahead of us. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at something uh, 
If you want to turn there, fine. If not, I'll just quote it to you. You can look it up later. Amos chapter 9, verse 13. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed. That's acceleration, divine acceleration. The New International Version says, The time is come, says the Lord, when the grain and the grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Now, the message translation reads this way. Yes, indeed, it won't be long now. Things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once, and everywhere you look, blessings. You got that up there, the message translation? Look at that. Back up to the front of it. Yes, indeed. It won't be long now, God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other, you won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once, and everywhere you look, blessings. Amen. Yes. Amen. Would you not call that divine acceleration? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. Now, let me point something out to you. Go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. I'm sure you're familiar with this story, but it's important that you hear it again right now. I won't read the whole thing, but just so you know where we're going here. Verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. Sounds like to me what he's saying is, it's not time yet for the miracles. But mama wanted a miracle. Who argues with mama? Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> and notice it says, his mother saith unto his servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. It sounds like to me she just ignored him. Doesn't it look that way? Oh, my time's not yet, mama. Uh, whatever he says to you, do it. Well, what other choice did he have? It looks like to me God sped up the time. <laughs> All right, now look at this. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews uh, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called for the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth the good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, I want to point this out to you. The very first miracle of Jesus involved divine acceleration. Amen. Amen. I'm, I've never been a wine drinker, uh, but I have people that I know out in California where they live in the area, and many of them before uh, they grew up, their, their, their families worked in the vineyards there. And I asked some of my friends that live out there, because I, I preach out in that part of the country quite often. And I asked them about the process of winemaking. And here's what one of them said to me. I wrote it down. Uh, in order for the wine to be produced, you have the growth and the ripening of the grapes, the crushing of them in proper vessels, and then the fermentation. 
And they went on to say, making wine is a long, slow process. It can take up to three years to get from the initial planting to the first harvest. And then it might not be bottled for another two years after that. Some even said that it can take up to four to eight years for the best wine. So we can see that the very first miracle of Jesus involved divine acceleration. Can you see that? He told them to pour the water into those pots. And by the time they poured the water into the pots, before it got to the bottom, it became wine. I, I read this from uh, C.S. Lewis's book called Miracles, and he said this, speaking about this. Jesus caused short-circuiting of a natural process. Short-circuiting of a natural process. Amen. What normally would take anywhere from four to eight years to become the good wine or the best wine, it happened in a split second from the time they poured it into the pots until the governor took his first drink. Divine acceleration. Now, how many of you remember the uh, great move of God, revival outpouring that took place down in Florida a few years ago? I think they called it, is it Brownville, Brownwood? You remember that? And it lasted for a long, long time. One of the men who was responsible for helping to usher that in was a man by the name of Dick Rubin. He's a born-again Jewish man. And Dick became a very close friend of mine. He's going home to be with the Lord now. But God used Dick tremendously to usher that in. And Dick used to come to our Bible school every year. He, he became one of our students' favorite speakers. And Dick's theme in ministry was this. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. And that's what he preached about. He said, God is a, a God of patterns. And when the pattern is right, then you can expect the glory to fall. And that's what he taught for weeks and weeks before that great move of God took place there. He got the people ready and got the pattern right. And the glory came. Okay? So... God being a God of patterns. You can see this in the Bible. Uh, you remember under the old covenant, the way for people to have their sins atoned for was how? Through blood. The blood of bulls and goats and heifers. How was sins remitted and done away with in the New Testament? Blood, but not bulls and goats and heifers the blood of Jesus. Notice a pattern. In fact, it says in the book of Hebrews that the, uh, the things that were done in the Old Testament was a, uh, a pattern or a foreshadow of things to come. So notice God used the same pattern that he used in the Old Covenant, the shedding of blood, but in the New Covenant, the shedding of blood through his own son and thereby the shedding of blood is never necessary again. But notice the pattern. God is a God of patterns. Having said that, in my study of this, since Jesus began his ministry with a miracle of divine acceleration and God being a God of patterns, do you suppose that God's plan to close out this church age is with divine acceleration, just like he started it with Jesus in divine acceleration. As Gomer Powell would say, that's a poser. <laughs> Amen. Think about it. If God began the ministry of Jesus with a miracle of divine acceleration and he being a God of patterns, then can we say that he's going to close out this church age with miracles of divine acceleration? Amen. That's why I believe we are in that time. We're in that season of divine acceleration. Now, that brings me to this point. 
when I, when I, like I said, I was born on a farm in Mississippi, Dixburg, Mississippi. My, my grandfather bought that property in 1927, just a small plot of land. And over a period of time, he, he was able to acquire, we had nearly 70 acres. My grandfather had cattle. He, had a, he kept 100 head of hogs on the, on the farm. Uh, grandma had chickens. Uh, he, he put uh, a lot of that acreage he sowed in crops, and we became totally self-contained. Uh, he, he, he had crops for all the family and, and even the neighborhood, if they didn't have good crops. Grandpa always had good crops, good harvest. And uh, he, would, he would set aside crops, uh, produce for them if they didn't have good crops. And then he would take produce to the market and sell it. Uh, he had cattle. He had hogs. We had a smokehouse. He, he, uh, we were self-contained, okay? Didn't have to buy an egg. We had the eggs. Didn't have to buy a chicken. Had a chicken <laughs> and a, had a bunch of them. Now, in those days, when I was born in 1946, same farm my dad grew up on in 1927, okay? And it didn't have, it didn't have plumbing in it when I was born. We had out, an outhouse, Anybody know what an outhouse is? <laughs> well, I don't know why Grandpa put the outhouse in the chicken yard. <laughs> but if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go through the chicken yard. And this crazy rooster attacked me every time I had to go to the bathroom. He jumped right on my shoulders and pecked my head all the way to the outhouse. And one day I fixed that rascal. I found Grandpa's 22 and I shot the rooster. Grandpa said, son, you shot my rooster. I said, he'll never peck my head again. <laughs> and then one day I'm sitting in the outhouse and a snake crawled in there. Hey. Woo, man, you never seen anybody jump so fast in all your life. And I went into the house and I couldn't find Grandpa's 22 because he put it aside, didn't want me shooting any more roosters. And so I just, I, just, uh, I just got me a stick and put a piece of cloth on the end of it and, and put some oil on it and threw it in the outhouse and blew up the outhouse. <laughs> snake and all. Grandpa said, son, you blew up my outhouse. I said, yeah, but that snake ain't gonna get in there no more. <laughs> my, 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 my girls think I'm making all this up, especially my grandchildren. Oh, Paul, Paul, you didn't live like that. Where were you when I lived like that? We didn't get indoor plumbing until 1957. Grandpa built a new house. It was one of them shotgun houses. You could stand out at the front and see all the way through the back. Had, had a couple of rooms on each side, you know, bedrooms. And uh, <clears throat> we didn't get <clears throat> indoor plumbing. We had a, a well. The first way we got water was a deep well, and, and you had a bucket on a rope. And you threw the bucket down there and, and wound that up and brought the water up. Then we got real fancy. Grandpa got us a pump. And he left a, a, a can of water over to the side. And he said, now, son, don't ever use this water. You got to prime the pump. And so you'd pour that in the pump, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. You're shaking your head and, and, and get the water out. But finally, in 1957, we got indoor plumbing. Oh, man, we were, we, we were certainly not, uh, you know, anywhere close to getting above poverty level, but, but we thought we were in high cotton then. We got an indoor sink and faucet and toilet. It gets hot in Mississippi. We didn't have air conditioning. You just kept the windows open all the time, you know. And finally, my dad, uh, after we'd moved to Shreveport, uh, dad bought grandpa a, an air conditioning unit to put in the living room. <clears throat> and dad put it in the window, mounted it for him, turned it on, and it's blowing cool air in there. Grandpa put his chair right in front of it. He couldn't believe it. he could get air out of that thing, cool air out of that thing. But grandpa, he was a miser. He went through the depression. And after the depression, I, I like to say it this way, God got grandpa out of the depression, but God never got depression out of grandpa because he still thought that way. 
Never trusted another bank as long as he lived. He buried his money on the farm. And when I found that out as a kid, I became a treasure hunter. I found money buried all over that farm. I didn't sell that farm until a few years ago. I wanted to make sure I'd found all the money first, you know. And uh, so dad set that air conditioning in there. And then I was going to stay over for the summer. And mom and dad went back to, to Louisiana. And as soon as dad left, grandpa cut that air conditioner off. I said, grandpa, what are you doing? He said, that thing's burning up money, son. It costs money to run that electricity. I said, grandpa, but we're cool. He said, no, we're not going to run that thing. Not, until, not unless we know your dad's coming. <laughs> and he wouldn't, he wouldn't turn it on. Now we got indoor plumbing and I'm in the bathroom in the house and he comes and turns the lights out. I said, Grandpa, I'm not done yet. He said, you've been in there too long, boy. You're burning up too much electricity. <laughs> now that's my background. Okay, now, I started going to the field with my grandfather when I was just a little boy. I remember when I got old enough and I was just a young boy, just a toddler, I'd see my grandpa going to the field with his mule and he plowed the field with a mule. And then sometime later, he was able to buy a 1927 Massey Ferguson tractor. Massey Ferguson tractor. I still have that tractor. <laughs> and I'd get on the back of it and this thing was, it was, it was like a, it was like a Sherman tank, steel cleats, you know, and we'd go, we'd go to the field. I said, Grandpa, run over that tree right there, you know, little <laughs> sapling. I said, run over that tree, and he'd take it and run over that tree, and he'd, he'd try to just demolish that tree. I thought that was the coolest thing. And then I'm watching Grandpa get the, get the soil ready for the sowing, and he worked. He worked, he worked, he worked hard. And when he finally got the, the, the soil ready, I'll never forget him saying this. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with this phrase or not, but my grandpa always, always said it like this. He said, son, we got to get the seed in the ground because the soil is hot. And that meant to him, I've done my preparation. I've got the ground prepared. We've got the seed. And now it's time to get it in the ground. The soil is hot. And he, he, his attitude was, you get as much seed in the ground as you possibly can and get it in the ground as fast as you can because the seed is hot, the soil is hot. And then as soon as we got all the seed in the ground and we got the tractor put away in the barn, next thing I'd hear my grandfather say was this, son, we have a good harvest this year. I say, grandpa, how do you know? How do you know? Every year you say we're going to have a good harvest. How do you know that? Not everybody over in our neighborhood has good harvest. He said, oh, son, I know I've prepared the soil. I planted the seed. The, the soil was hot, and we're going to have a good harvest. And then he'd tell me, son, you, you could throw a stick in the ground and cover it up, and it'll be a tree next, next harvest. I believed him. I said, why do we have good harvest? He said, because we got the seed in the ground when the soil was hot. Not only that, there's a good old Mississippi Delta soil. Amen. And we did. We had good crops every year. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. We're in a time of acceleration. I believe we are rapidly approaching Amos chapter 9. I'm going to read it to you again from the message translation. Yes, indeed. It won't be long now. Things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once, and everywhere you look, blessings. Everywhere you look, blessings. This ministry, this church, as you've seen from the short video presentation, is blessing people all over the world. Not just this community, not just you and your families, but blessing people all over the world. God didn't put that Falcon 50 in this ministry to just be sitting in a hangar. Now, 
Mac and I have talked about Falcon 50s for years. He knew that's what I was believing for. It's what he was believing for. We've been talking about Falcon 50s for years. And God didn't give it to him only to honor his faith. He gave it to him as a tool to get as many people into the kingdom of God as you possibly can because the soil is hot. The soil is hot, folks. The soil is hot. Get as much seed in the soil as you possibly can and get it in as fast as you can. Hallelujah. And notice what it says, the promise of God. Blessings everywhere you look. Everywhere you look. Tony has been traveling me. He's one of my graduates from my Bible school. Uh, 23 years ago he came. He's a former uh, NFL football player. Played with the Canadian Football League. Played with the USL Football League. Came to my Bible school. His training he received there changed his life. And he's traveled with me all over the world. All over the world. He also owns a business. Uh, a custom blind business. Every time he travels with me, as soon as we get on the airplane, his phone starts ringing. More business. More business. Am I telling you the truth? More business. More business. More business. More business. He's heard me teach on the message, Increase by Association. And he believes it. And it's working for him. In fact, every time that phone rings, I just tell him, Keep them tied, check some and coming, son. <laughs> and it's almost, you can't get the seed in the ground before the harvest is already coming up. Hallelujah. Folks, we're in a time of acceleration. Yes. If you need big time harvest today in this season, then this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to get all the seed in the ground that you possibly can. And if I were you, I'd do it as quick as I possibly could. I, I've had so many times this year, just since the Lord gave me this message, I've had so many times this year that, and, and our, our ministry, we support a lot of other ministries all over the world. We, 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 we tie that of JSMI, we tie that of Heritage of Faith, and we, we actually give far more than 10% every, every month. We have tithe accounts. I believe in tithing, praise God, but I do it not as a command, I do it as a choice, hallelujah. Amen. And since it's been working for me real well, I'm going to keep right on doing it. Praise God. Amen. And, and there have been so many times this year as I was bringing a check to plant it into a ministry or to sow it into a church where they're building uh, a, a, a new uh, building program. Before I could even get it in the pastor's hand, my office would call and say, we just got a harvest the harvest was coming in before I could even get the seed in the ground. That is Amos chapter 9. Yes. That's, right. That's Amos chapter 9. We are in a time of divine acceleration. Amen. I challenge you to get in the flow of it, praise God, and catch hold of the vision of this church just like you did last year. You got the plane up and running. It is ready, and praise God, all we need now is the money to get these churches built. And we're going to have it this week. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Amen. And because I don't ever do anything, I don't uh, ever ask anybody to do anything I'm not willing to do myself. So I'm going to plant a seed into it as well. Why? Because the soil is hot. And we're, we're in a building program back home and I'm building a new auditorium. We just finished the new uh, uh, maintenance building. We finished the new uh, uh, storage building facilities. And now we're getting ready to start the new auditorium. And any church that's doing missions and any church that's in a building program, I'm getting seed in it just as quick as I can because the soil is hot. And praise God, it is Amos 9 time. God is going to see to it that your harvest comes almost before you can get the seed in the yes, ground. Sir. And everywhere yes, you look, blessings. Everywhere you look, blessings. Come on, stand up and say, everywhere I look, blessings. Say it again. Everywhere I look, everywhere blessings. I look. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and begin to thank God right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
I deliver this word that you have given me and I pray in Jesus' name that it has spoken to the hearts of these people and that it has become deeply rooted in their hearts. Lord, I didn't preach this just so they'll give an offering. I preached it because I'm under command to do so. You told me to take it everywhere I preach this year. Up to this point, I've taken it everywhere. I will continue to do so until you tell me otherwise. And Lord, we're getting testimonies from people all over the world that are experiencing the open hand of God, supernatural, unusual, extraordinary provision. And they're even saying letters I've read just before flying here today. Brother Jerry, I'm experiencing divine acceleration. And you're no respecter of persons. So I'm expecting you to do the same for this group of people, both in this auditorium and those that are watching by live stream. As they get ready to sow their seed in this hot soil, fertile ground. And Lord, I'm believing along with them that the harvest is going to come up so quickly. As the message translation says, it'll make their head swim. Blessing, blessings, blessings everywhere they look. In Jesus' name, amen. And somebody shout, I receive it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I uh, mentioned this before I turn it back to Brother Mac. That message is in this newest book. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, God's Word in Troubled Times. And then one of the ways that God has always uh, met my needs supernaturally, extraordinarily, is the favor of God. This new book came out the same time this one did, and I call it, hey, that's the favor of God. Lord taught me about favor in 1969, and he said, every time you experience my favor, stop right then and say out loud, hey, that's the favor of God. And he said, that way, you'll begin to expect it more, and you'll see more manifestations of it. I am experiencing the favor of God. I've experienced it all my Christian life, 53 years but I'm experiencing it more now than I ever have before. Why? We're in divine acceleration. Amen. So two new books that are available. Check it out. Brother Mac. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all give the Lord a praise. Listen, um, sit down for a minute. Put your seed in the soil while the soil is hot. Amen. We're going to receive the offering now. So ushers, come on forward and... I believe the Lord will direct each of you accordingly and thank you in advance for being a part of what the Lord is doing in this ministry. Go ahead. Well, I just, uh, I want y'all to get excited about what this week is going to lead to, how it's going to culminate. Pray, come to each of the services. If there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus, please, or anybody that needs prayer, please come to the altar when we dismiss. We'd love to be the church in your life. Thank you for being a part of my life, this ministry's life. And uh, we've got a lot to look forward to. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow night. Amen. Amen.